I'll just start with it. Uh, so, um, so last time, well, last time I said there were sort of four, four different things that uh, you know we usually cover in statistics and science and uh, physics and astronomy. So one was uh, point estimation. Um, one was uh, uh, the the ideas of uh, um, of uh, uh, hypothesis testing. Uh, um, then there were ideas of uh, confidence intervals. <clears throat> and then uh, and then the last was commissive. Point estimation was the idea you have some data, you have some function that tries to estimate some parameter, and we talked about the properties of those things like, you know, variance and bias, and we talked about the Kramer row bound, and <clears throat> we talked about this idea that if you allow yourself to have some bias in your in your estimator, that you can you can sometimes do better. And so we have this James Stein uh, estimator example. So this I <clears throat> sort of mainly covered, and I gave my one example about goodness of fit to just say something. Um, so it's mainly talked about, I guess I can come back and make some point about goodness of fit after we do. So today I want to talk mainly about hypothesis testing and confidence intervals, and I will focus mainly on uh, uh, likelihood uh, uh, based um, tests. Okay, so um, now one thing that uh, I ended up with last time, we kind of ran late on time, so I didn't get to do it very carefully, is I was talking about this, uh, when we were talking about point estimation, you, you can ask, like, you know, how good is your estimator, right? You know, like, I have to have, have a true value for this parameter, and then I have, or parameters, and I have some way of estimating those things, and how good is it, right? So one way, so then you need to say what you mean by how good it is, and I think a lot of statistics is really just about formalizing the question, and once you've done it, then things become much more clear. So if you care about variance and you don't want it to be biased, then you have this k morale. If you care about uh, mean squared error, then you know then we have this James Stein example. So there are all these things, and there's a more this more general framework for talking about an arbitrary type of uh, loss or or utility. You know, so given a true value for the parameters and given the data, uh, you're going to do something. And you know, so like you're going to uh, either reject or not a hypothesis, or you're going to uh, you know decide to take a bet, or you're going to build a collider, or something like that. Um, and so you can talk about uh, if you can come up with a loss function for like you know if you did the right thing or not, and how good or bad you did. Uh, then then there's this whole framework for talking about that. So you, there's this notion of risk, which is. Uh, which is basically an average over the data, like for different outcomes, what your loss would be, okay? And then there's an idea of an expected risk, which now has to do with a, um, or expected loss, which comes from averaging over the parameters, and there's all these different things, so I'm not gonna go through all of that, but I did make this point uh, <clears throat> that, um, so once you, once you say what it is that you want to do, so once you define, you know, if you define uh, this, uh, this loss function, um, and then that turns into some notion of, of, of risk, uh, which depends on the true value of the parameter. If you can come up with some sort of procedure, you know, that you're going to do that all that has lower risk for all values of theta, then this kind of procedure is called permissible. It's a good procedure. If you have a uh, and if you, and if, so if, if you have a procedure that's never better than one of the other ones, then there's no reason you would use it. So you call it inadmissible. Okay, so that. Um, uh, so, uh, so in that James Stein example, the James Stein example was admissible because it always did better, and the maximum likelihood estimator was not admissible because it always did worse. Okay, so, um, and then there was this kind of important theorem that it turns out that all of these sort of uh, admissible procedures you can think of as a Bayesian type of, of procedure. Um, so, so I'll just say, and so all uh, <coughs> admissible uh, procedures. Um, um, are amazing. Okay, so um, so I'm just kind of repeating what I said last time, but I, did, I wanted to make this point again. Um, sorry. Um, uh, 
is that they're, they're, they're Bayesian, but then this is the important part uh, for some prior. So I'll write pi of theta. Okay. And this, so it means that if you, if you say what you care about, you can use the Bayesian infrastructure for, for coming up with, you know, for doing whatever you're going to do, your hypothesis test or your, your parameter estimation or something like that. And you can use that Bayesian infrastructure to get something that will be admissible, uh, but, but it, it's for some random prior that's, that may not have anything to do with your degree of belief. So another way of interpreting this thing is not as a prior, but just as some random weight function over the parameter space or something like that. And, uh, and then you're just using the Bayesian machinery as like a calculational tool, okay? Um, but nevertheless, it is a big hint that, uh, you know, it's a good thing to know. Um, and, uh, and so, uh, um, so I, I'll, try, I'll, I'll mention this again, an example when I talk about hypothesis testing. Um, okay, now, so afterwards, uh, Patrick told me that, you know, that was all well and good, but I hadn't really motivated or framed this Bayesian frequentist discussion very well, so, uh, so let me, uh, so let me do that now, and let's talk about uh, let's talk about these two things. So, so, so for hypothesis testing, I just want to think uh, I'll use okay, I'll use the example of the Higgs. We just claimed discovery of the Higgs boson. Um, that was sort of bigger than a uh, you know five uh, five signal effect, which um, translates into some sort of probability. Uh, which okay, I'm not even write down the number because I don't want to. Uh, uh, you're thinking too much. So then we'll talk about you know, discovery of the Higgs, and then I'll also talk about uh, confidence intervals. So this could either be like the mass of the Higgs and the cross-section of the Higgs, or it could be like lambda for dark matter and lambda for the cosmological constant. So just like some parameter space. And you see these kinds of plots all the time, right? There's some sort of contour with the best fit point, and there's some contour. <coughs> and let's say this thing is even labeled like 95% of contour. Okay. So, so let me ask two questions. So, what is the sort of precise statement that goes along with the discovery of the Higgs? Okay, you know, you, could, you claim a discovery, and we had some data, right? We collected some data, and afterwards we're going to make some sort of probability statement. So, I don't care about the numbers, but what's the form of the statement? Anyone want to throw up a... That there's only a probability that's very small that that happened by chance without, without the Higgs existing. Is that, uh, is that a way to say it? That's that's one way to say it. So do you yeah, think you that do a hundred trials on five times of input and so uh, five times out of hundred? Oh wait for the ninety five percent. Okay, yeah, let's talk let's focus on that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay, so is it is it something like that the yeah? yeah. I mean they usually say I have some five sigma, three sigma detection that gives us some confidence that we've actually detected it. Right, so if we take that and try to make that a little bit more formal, like some confidence that I've detected the Higgs, is it some sort of statement that, you know, I probably detected the Higgs? So like the probability of the Higgs, given the data that I have, is, you know, pretty high? It's also the particular energy range, so it's not just that it exists. Um, or are we going to ignore that? Uh, well, um, yeah, I don't know. I mean, the, the, I mean, there's a question of if it exists or not, which is kind of binary, and then there's a question of where it is. Um, so. Um, so if we just care about the exists or not question, but, um, so if somehow like intuitively you want it to be a statement that's like the probability that the Higgs exists um, given the data, right? You want it to be something like that, right? That's kind of seems like what we're after. But from this sort of Bayes theorem way, this is you know going to be probability of the data given the Higgs, and then some prior probability on the Higgs. And then some normalization, some <coughs> normalization to make that thing work. So, um, so this is kind of strange. If I ever want to make a statement like this, I have to assume something about if the Higgs exists or not, right? So you're not going to be able to make a statement like this unless you make some prior assumption about if the Higgs exists or not. And most people don't really want to do that because they think either the Higgs exists or it doesn't exist. And I don't know which one. And and you don't want you know. And scientifically, maybe I don't want to like have my results based on that kind of assumption, okay? Um, so, so that's, you know, there's just no getting around that. So, I, um, so whatever, the, so the statement is not of this form, it has to be somehow of this form. Some statement about the probability of the data that you got given the Higgs, or probably the data given no Higgs. And for this five sigma, 
it is a random, it's about the probability that you got the data given no Higgs. Okay, so that was sort of our null hypothesis beforehand, so the situation without the Higgs. We got a bunch of data, there was a huge bump there, okay, sort of huge, and, that, and then we said, well, this is not compatible with the no Higgs hypothesis, so we're going to reject it, right? Okay, so in the hypothesis testing, The setup is going to be that I have uh, some, uh, I'll, I'll talk about a null and an alternate, okay, so there will be the, the two situations, you know, H, H naught is true, this is like, I'll call them, you know, the null, okay, and then the other one, my alternate, you know, uh, uh, H1 is true, and then I will do one of two things, I will either uh, uh, reject my null, or I will uh, accept my null. So then you just have this like table that I'm sure you've seen before. Okay, so if H naught is true and I accept H naught, you know, good job. And if H one is true and I uh, then I and I reject the null, then that's good. Like the alternate, <coughs> the Higgs is there, and I rejected the situation. There's no Higgs. And then there are the, these these two kinds of mistakes that I can make, right? So this one is usually called uh, type whatever type one. You could call them whatever you want. So it's usually called type two, and then there's some probability associated with those things. So if H naught is true, and I have some procedure for that I'm gonna to apply to the data that will end up in, you know, I'm going to choose one of these two decisions, uh, there's a, the probability associated with this you know, is usually called alpha, and the probability that when H1 is true, uh, and you still, you know, so the Higgs is actually there, but you, you don't claim discovery, uh, that's probability called beta. <coughs> okay. okay. Uh, so H1 true means uh, really just H0 false, or it's another kind of hypothesis? Yeah, are H1, is there an H1 uh, complement? <coughs> yeah, so the way that uh, it's usually talked about in, in like statistics is uh, what you do is, uh, is reject or accept <laughs> the null, okay? Um, you know, so rejecting the null doesn't, you know, logically mean that you're somehow accepting the alternate, but you know, in practice, Usually, that's what they mean the same thing. Okay, um, you can leave some kind of never you know, some intermediate land where I don't do anything. Like I reject the sorry, I reject the null, but I the alternate doesn't look good or something. Uh, so this then you start over. <clears throat> yeah. So so that's actually an important point, and it's related kind of to the point that I wanted to make about goodness of fit. In goodness of fit, you have some data and you have a null hypothesis, and you try to say like. Is this a good fit or not? And if it's, it's a really bad fit, then you might reject your null, but it's, there's no alternate that you're testing against, okay? Um, so in this, in this way of framing it, this is the sort of <coughs> Nyman Pearson way of doing it. So th this way was sort of the Fisher, you know, Fisher was the guy that sort of thought about it this way. And this is the Nyman and Pearson, okay? So, um, and they, they said, well, it'll be a little bit, you know, part of the problem is that you can construct a, a, some sort of test that will like, only, you know, that sort of just is like the top row of this. I have some test, and if H naught is true, I'll accidentally reject it with some probability, or I'll accept it with, you know, you know, the, the other probability, one minus that, I guess. So that, but it's, uh, um, but what property, is that a good test or not, or something like that? And this way of setting things up, what you're going to do is say, I have some tolerant, you're going to treat the two asymmetrically, and that's somehow very important in the Nyman Pearson. That the null and the alternate are not treated in a symmetric way. So the null is special. You say, I have some tolerance for rejecting the null and it's true, and I'm going to fix it, okay? Um, and then my goal is to maximize, well, minimize my rate of type two error, okay? And then there's a, a quantity called one minus beta, okay, which is basically here, except H1. <coughs> you know, when H1 is true, you reject the null and you claim discovery. You want to minimize beta with different H1s? Um, uh, I'm sorry. Do so you want to minimize beta for different H one? In this setup, the H naught and H one are fixed. There's like okay. a null and a, an alternate. I'll talk you, about this. What are you this. changing when you're minimizing these factors? <clears throat> uh, basically, like uh, what the requirement on the data is. Um, okay. Yeah, okay. like how, 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 how big does the bump have to be, okay. or something okay. like that, okay. right? So I'll, I'll I'll get into this more. So this one minus beta is, is often called the power of the test. Right? <laughs> how often you're going to reject the null slash claim discovery when the alternate thing is actually true, okay? And you want a powerful test, right? You want to be able to claim discovery when there's actually new physics there as often as possible, 
but you're going to do it under a constraint that you, you reject the null when it's true with some, you know, fixed probability. Okay. And are there, four, are there four different calculations, or is there one calculation that gives you four numbers? Yeah, maybe I should just draw a picture. Okay, so if I draw a picture, a simple thing, um, you know, so here's, you know, data or something like that, and let's call this uh, H0 and this H1. Uh, the thing that I will control, say, is, you know, where, like if the data is beyond here, I will reject the null and accept the alternate. And the thing I get to adjust is where that threshold is, right? Okay. So, so they're all correlated. They're all yeah, exactly. So, so in that, this situation, uh, this, is, this is alpha, oh, nice. right? And then on the other side over here, you know, th th this probability is beta, I guess. And then this is 1 minus beta. And this is 1 minus alpha. <laughs> OK, so then okay, so I'm just being a little too abstract. So, the, uh, so that's. But, uh, so I want to say something when it's not a simple case of like one-dimensional data and like you know. Um, so in this Nyman Pearson way, you really you treat the two things very asymmetrically in terms of how the null and the alternate are treated. But uh, and this I guess is another thing that I wanted to uh, kind of make as a general point is that in all these things, you know, when I said that a lot of statistics is about saying what you want, part of it is about saying, uh, you know, how good you're doing is a real value number. Okay, you know, if you're going to try to maximize something and choose like a best procedure, you have to, you have to have a, a notion that's like these ideas of risk and loss. They have to be real value numbers. You can't, you cannot optimize, to, you can't have like both the highest energy and the cheapest, you know, accelerator simultaneously, right? You need to pick some mixture of the two, um, and that's just true in life. Okay, you know, you, and and it's a. Uh, it's hard because you don't. You have to make choices about the relative importance of all these things. But um, so Nyman Pearson said, you know, they, they were clear about the thing that they wanted to uh, optimize. Um, and I guess I'll even say a little bit that. Uh, so David's not here. Um, I agree with the point that in the Bayesian procedure, like <coughs> if you have if, now Higgs was not like yes or no, but I thought of it as like some parameter. So let me just think of it as theta. Here, like this, okay. So now, when I when I do this base theorem, I'm going to get some probability distribution on on, on theta. Um, you know, so I get some data, and I use base theorem to get some you know posterior distribution for theta. A lot of Bayesians would say this is the answer, and I'm done. And I agree, it has all the information, and it's great. Uh, but it's also kind of a cop out in the sense of you didn't get to tell me what it is that you're trying to do. Right, so you didn't kind of go into this that you tell me what your utility or risk or whatever is. So I don't actually know if that's better or not. Right. So then what you would do Wait, with this object? What's that? I don't know. Why do you think you don't? Know, like, why do you think they don't tell you? <laughs> 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 yeah. Why do you think they don't tell you what they do? No. It, I, don't know what I mean, if you tell me what you want to do, then I can, you know, like I'm going to. You need to. If you if you su supply me some so, risk okay, function, so let me let me yeah. rephrase this. Let me pretend I'm dead. Right. So you say, <laughs> say, say there's only one thing you can do, and that's write down the likelihood function. And then so that's that's the thing that you're using, right? Uh, no, I just wanted to say in terms of like, you know, if if two people come and they both have some procedures and they're honestly like who's better or something. Um, if you want to evaluate that or try to figure out among a whole bunch of choices of yeah. procedures who's better, you need to tell me like what it is, what you mean by better, right? So that's a, you know, it's a map to real, real number. And this is not a real number, this is a distribution, right? So you could take this distribution and then do the next step and then see if it's better or not. And I also told you that all of the procedures are basic, so I'm not saying it's not a good way to go. I'm just saying that, uh, it, you know, stopping there, that it's true there's all this information, but you haven't gone to the last step. Okay. So it's kind of like a cop out in some sense. Okay. I see what you're saying. Yeah. I don't know that I think it's a cop out. Yeah. Well, I just mean that you haven't gone to the, the final stage. So, um, I mean, I don't think it's a bad, uh, yeah. I mean, the information is there, but there's still more to the, more to the question. Sure. Are you going to come back to what five sigma means? Uh, yeah, uh, sure. Yeah. So, the, so in, in the five sigma, there's sort of two versions of it. Uh, uh, one is that, um, if I just use this picture, one is that uh, beforehand I'm going to claim a discovery, uh, uh, my, my, my threshold for discovery is quote 5 sigma, which if these things are Gaussian, it literally is like you go over 5 sigma, and then that means that, so, that, so 
And so having a five sigma threshold for discovery yeah, is equivalent to saying that this alpha quantity is whatever it is, two times 10 to the minus seven, I think. Um, uh, so it's like, uh, you know, so that, that's a, um, the other thing that you can do is not think of it as a threshold like the, so if the data is beyond that point, I'm gonna claim a discovery if it's below that point, it's not, that's how, you know, the classical hypothesis testing would be set up. There's a binary decision that it draws it. You could also just say that my data sits here, you know, what is that probability? And then that's, that probability from the data on is called a p-value, okay? And so a lot of times we say it's like, you know, 6.2 sigma significant or something. So it's kind of, uh, it's, a, it's sort of like I adjust the threshold to the data and then I ask like what test does that correspond to or something. So what is your one sentence you were, you were Yeah, so, so right, so, so it should be that, um, uh, so that by, you know, uh, um, so, so again, at, at that point, I, I need to tell you which five sigma I'm referring to if I'm talking about the threshold or if I'm talking about the data. Uh, so claiming a discovery, I guess you can just say that, uh, that you know, my threshold for discovery was that the probability of getting the data when the Higgs is not there, uh, you know, had to be smaller than a certain amount for me to claim a discovery, and it was, you know, okay. So that's not a, um, but it, it is, you know, the, the, they're always the same, the thing that's kind of strange is this, uh, uh, and I think this is also important for talking to like the media a little bit, I think part of why it's been complicated is that the Bayesian way has a, like a declarative statement associated to it, the probability of the Higgs given the data is something period, right? And uh, the frequentist one has a conditional in it, which is like harder for the public to swallow. It's the probability of the data uh, given, you know, if this hypothesis is true, is something, right? And so the fact that there's an if sitting in there that you can't get rid of, I think makes it, you know, uncomfortable to say for people, and, that, and, and somehow it's not asking a lot of the public, but it's asking a little bit more than a nice declarative statement. So, and this hypothesis is the standard model background? Uh, yeah, in, in the case of the Higgs, it's like, which is also not even like a well-defined model field theory, but we'll you know, <laughs> forget about that. Different seminar. Okay, so, uh, so I kind of got into this a little bit more than I wanted. First, I was just going to ask some kind of, you know, Socratic method type questions to get you thinking. Uh, so, but can I move to the, so the, the, the other thing and then we'll come back to this and I'll treat this a little bit nicer. Yeah. Uh, just to understand, you said that the p-value is the... Uh, how far you are beyond the threshold that you asked, you know? Uh, so, so the, so, um, uh, okay, yeah, I, I, I didn't mean to get into all of this right first, but yeah, so the idea is this, that there's, there's a threshold for the test, which corresponds, so normally you would, before you look at the data, you would fix alpha to some critical value, and that, that, that thing is sometimes called like the size of the test, okay, so it's like, how, so I'm going to claim a discovery, I'm going to reject my null, uh, and you fix your alpha to like, usually it's like 5% or 10% or 1% or this ridiculously small number for 5 sigma, okay? And so then, I once you- How you choose that? What's that? How do you choose that? <laughs> that is completely arbitrary. Arbitrary, yeah. 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 Um, it depends on your psychology. Or yeah, <laughs> yeah so, so that, so, well, I mean, the thing, uh, so one thing that you could do, which I guess, is if you go back to this risk thing, and you think that you can try to, figure out uh, sort of what to do, like what's going to optimize my, my risk. But if you go down that road a little bit, you'll realize that, that it's, it's almost impossible to do because, you know, the risk that you have depends on which one of those things is true and you don't know which one's true. So for me to do it, I need to weight them. So for me to do, to make that choice in an appropriate way, I have to choose some prior <laughs> assumption about the two. So, so actually some frequentist uh, approaches I think are good for communicating science, but they're very bad for making decisions. So I was going to say, how is fixing that parameter different from assuming a prior, I guess? But in, like, well, it's not so a prior at all. It's but just no, a, I mean, higher up. It's, it's basically what you're saying. Oh, yeah. If you, if you chose, yeah, no, it is kind of like a, uh, that's true. Yeah. If you, if I, if, I, if I chose my, my <laughs> if I chose my risk and I put on a prior, it would imply an alpha, and I can sort of work that backwards. So, okay. Um, I actually did that for my thesis, and it corresponds to like the ratio of the utility of claiming a discovery like when it's true, and 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 uh, and, and uh, you know you, you have some combination of all of, of each of these four things. Like I claim 
a claim and discovery when it's true. That's worth like you know five million dollars of funding next year, right? Uh, I claim a discovery when it's not, and a little bit later we realize that we were wrong and then we're all disgraced. It's actually a question of how bad that is. Maybe the public doesn't really care, or maybe they would be like, well, I don't trust you, and you don't give me more funding for the rest of your life, right? And then there's like uh, you know all these different things, you know. The null is we don't claim, you know, discovery of supersymmetry because it's not there, but you know it's not very exciting. And then the, you know, there's all these different things that you can work out, right? So if you put those utilities, you can work out. The, the. In the case you never went to H1, you never thought about an alternate and also the power of one of the one minus beta. Oh no. Uh, yeah. So let me get to that. So I mean, I could, well, I'm in it now, but I just uh, <laughs> okay. I, I, can I just ask the one question here, and then I'll and then I'll move. On, I'll come right back to this. Is for these things. Uh, what do you think for 95% confidence interval? What do you think that thing means? What What any reason? No, what I had said before. Like five times, even if the effect is not there, five times it will. But the, here there's no effect to have a parameter space, right? 95% of the time the parameter is inside that circle. When you measure it. Right. That, that is like, right. So 95% of the time uh, the parameter is inside the circle, but, and, okay, so in which sense of the, in which sense do you mean of the time? Does it mean the probability that the true parameter is inside the circle is 95%? Mm -hmm. Yes. Right. No. That is probability of parameter given data, right? Yeah. It's the probability that you measure data that gives you a value of that parameter being that zero. Uh, well, I'm gonna. My measurement is, is going to. My measurement is call it the x, right? The x will always be, you know, my best fit. My best fit to the data is somehow like the center of the you circle. You only measure right? it once. Well, I, I meant like you Sorry. measure it again. <laughs> okay, so there's some notion of repeated measurements. Yeah. Uh, will the will the x's move around and somehow be there? That's a reasonable thing, and that's a somehow a statement. But it, then it has no connection to the true value, right? Like I could come up with some random thing that has nothing to do with the Higgs and just get, put scatter points in the in the plane, right? And then I could still do that. Um, so so let's say so one thing is that in this way of thinking, I guess the true value is somewhere in that plane, right? I don't know where it is, but just you know for yourself, pick a point, right? It's either in the circle or it's not in the circle, right? It's either in the contour or it's not. So, um, if you think that there is a true value, then that, that you know the probability that the true value is in that circle is one or zero, right? So let's just pick a spot and call call this it. Okay. So for this particular data set, you know this is the true value. This is actually God real. told you. Yeah, yeah. God told me, and it's also the thing that produced the data. The data fluctuated in some way such that. My best fit was here, and when I draw my little contour, it looked like that, and it doesn't contain the true value. That, that's sort of that's sort of like you know one of these kinds of mistakes, right? So the uh, um, so I've rejected the true value when it was true. So I kind of made one of these mistakes. Okay. So um, now if I got different data, you've also made the other mistake. You accepted the true value that's false. Except uh, to the value it's upset yeah, inside yeah, that. Sure, sure. Yeah. So it gets they're they're both they're both happening. So I'll come back to it. In a, I'll come back to that in a second. So, um, so the thing that I uh, that I want to get at now is if I get different data, I will get a different best fit point and a different contour. Right? So the, the, the property that you want a, a confidence interval to have when you talk about a ninety five you know, when you see a plot that says this is a ninety five percent, at least if it's frequentist confidence interval. The meaning of that thing is that if I apply my procedure, you know, over and over again, if the, the contours that I get will cover the true value 95% of the time. Okay. Say it one more time. It, the, the, the same as I have a procedure, when I when I apply it to the data, it will draw contours, and the contours will cover the true value 95% of the time. <coughs> that's what that's the property you want it to have. Then you have to show if it has that property. For all values and contours, I think. And that's the, well, the, the contour is a property of the, you get data, you apply your procedure, and you get a contour, right? So, um, so, the, so the for all is for all true values. So that's the hard part, is like how am I going to come up with a procedure that that's going to be true, the procedure will cover the true value 95% of the time. 
What's for changed? all values of the truth, you know, for and I don't know because I don't know the truth, and it has to work everywhere. What's changing when you say at the time in this case? Uh, the data. So I pick uh, it. So okay. so, for, so, have, so I need something that's going to be true. You know, that's going. I need that statement to work for all about. You know, for all assumed true values. So I get to, for any point, I get to imagine that's the true point now. It's producing data. I'm going to take a procedure for that data. I'm going to draw a contour and do that over and over again for lots of data, and it should cover the true value 95% of the time. So then there's a, so the, the so the next question is how in the hell am I going to pull that off? Because that doesn't sound easy. Okay. So so I, um, so that's the setup. So let me try and talk about. Uh, uh, so let me talk. About, uh, it turns out that the two the two are really the same. Okay. Um, so that the uh, so I'm going to talk about hypothesis testing first, and then we're going to use our result from hypothesis testing to do that. Okay. Um, okay so um, right. So um, what a, um, um, okay. So let me think about. How am I gonna say this? Okay, so I'll, re I'll refer back to this picture because it's really simple to look at and it's easy to think about, but I want to think about the same problem more abstractly, okay? So my data is gonna be arbitrary data, okay? It can be high dimensional and I can have a whole bunch of measurements, okay? So I could have like, I could have a thousand, 15, you know, a thousand measurements of some 15 dimensional vector or something like that. So, so for instance, if you want- uh, One example. Yeah, so here, here's an example. I have an electron uh, that runs into my particle detector. My particle detector is like broken up into a bunch of pieces. And I measure energy in each of these calorimeter cells. So I have, and, uh, and when electrons hit it, uh, they tend to fill up this thing in some sort of you know, cloudy way. So there's a probability that I get a certain amount of energy over the, you know, all the, these calorimeter cells. So I know what the probability density looks like in this, you know, whatever 20-dimensional space uh, if there's actually an electron. So this I can call like my null, you know. And then I have another one that it's now instead of an electron, it's like a pion, okay. And and it hits the detector, uh, but because it's a different kind of particle, it, it makes a bigger, funkier, you know, a bigger, funkier shower, and it has a different distribution. And in my data, I'm going to have like, you know, a million examples of these. I mean, a million, you know, measurements of my detector, and I want to know, like, do, are there pions or, or are these electrons or something like that. Okay, so, um, all right, so, <coughs> so, <coughs> so let me, um, so I'm gonna, um, so I'm gonna define uh, uh, w is a region of the data, okay? So it's like a scenario for the data uh, such that if x is, is in W, okay? Um, so if you want, it's, it's a, you know, oh, well, let me write it, and then I'll point to the one-dimensional thing. Uh, if x is, uh, you know, such that, uh, if x is in W, I'm going to accept H0, okay? Okay, so in that picture, once I've, you know, sort of fixed my the this alpha. You know, I know where to draw this line. So this this whole region right here, you know, uh, is W, right? If the data falls in here, I'm going to accept H naught. If it falls in the complement of W, I'm going to reject H naught. Okay. Um, <coughs> that's I haven't done anything. I just defined some W. Defined You're right. So uh, basically, so. Uh, so I want to work in the situation where alpha is fixed. So okay, so um, and I'm going to I'm going to require okay, that the probability that x is in W given h naught equals alpha. Okay. So this is I'm going to so W is my region where I'm accept, accepting the data, and I'm going to move it. You know, it has to have. Uh, sorry, not alpha. But one, sorry, one minus one minus alpha. Okay, good. Sorry. Yeah. Or you know the complement or something. Okay. So so uh, so the so it this region W where I accept the data is, is satisfies this constraint. So that's my starting point. And now <clears throat> I want to ask the question uh, uh, what region you know W uh, 
maximizes the power. So that's like super duper general, right? Okay, so this is what I want. This is for my, my data in general. Uh, <coughs> can I come up with something that is, you know, some way of constructing this region that's going to always be the best? Yeah. So it, this doesn't seem to mimic reality terribly well in the sense that I feel like there's got to be a region between W, if there's one line, there are really two lines. Like you turn on your collider and like one second in, you know, you're way down in W. And, I mean, obviously, right, there's no signal yet. And you, you happily accept the, the uh, null. But you don't go say, I accept the null, turn off the glider. You keep running the glider until you get to some other threshold. So there's, you know, there's in some sense two thresholds. Um, well, I guess every time that you, uh, I mean, at the very beginning, these two things are just sitting on top of each other, you know, because you have no sensitivity, right? Right. And as you collect more data, and these distributions are moving apart, and you're, and you're, you, you know, you're somehow more, for the same five sigma test, you get more and more power, right? Um, so then there's a, a totally different question of like, when do you ask this question, you know? Uh, uh, so you, it's either it's when the conference is, it's when you run out of money to keep running the accelerator, right. or you do it constantly. And right. then like uh, health tests where they you know, subject people to like, drugs and stuff like that, there's actually, you don't want to keep running the test because you're, you know, there's some risk for those people, so there's like ethical issues. So that whole decision is called, is something called the stopping rule, and uh, there are some like <clears throat> very deep things that I don't want to talk about right now about how, the, you know, if your inference is, depends on stopping the rule or not, things like that. But for this, let's just say that we're going to run for a year and that there's going to be a conference and we're going to look at the data, so this is like completely, it's all fixed. So no, you're going to accept her. But it just seems to me like if you have like a two sigma signal at a year, you're, you know, you're screwed basically. Like, well, I mean, you're going to write the paper. I mean, the idea is I'm going to execute this procedure now, right? Yeah. So, and then, and I'm going, and at that point, I'm able to accept or reject. Okay, so the result of what the result is? Yeah, you write the paper and you say there's no substantial evidence. I, I, I often yeah. just don't write the paper, but then it's like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, wow, two sigma result. What else can I write? That's, that's true. No, it's that's true. A higher level. Yeah, that's a higher level question. And it's also like you could write it if yeah. there were if you cloned yourself, you could write all this data. Yeah, in some sense, because you don't write it, the scientific literature is biased in this way. Um, Sorry, <laughs> it actually affects a lot of drug tests. Exactly, exactly practice. Yeah. Like they don't show null results. Right. Uh, so then they do, and people. Yeah. But I guess that my problem is it's not so much that like I have a really strong null and I can really reject the the hypothesis quite clearly. It's where you're sort of in this intermediate land and. <laughs> You actually don't care so much how powerful your test is when you're in this intermediate land. So I don't know. Maybe it was just yeah. Well, I mean, I just for, for you know for any particular amount of data, you get two plots like this, but and and it, the test has some power. But, okay. Right. In this case, you know, I'm thinking of it as a one-sided thing, but I could have like, for instance, done a different version. You know, like I could have done from between <coughs> here and over here. You know, where the tail probability is still alpha. That's a different test, a different region W. Um, and the question is, so there's like two choices, which region W is more powerful, right? So, so I'm going to ask this, so I'm asking this in a super general setting, and the thing that's kind of cool is that uh, there is a very simple procedure that is the most powerful in general, um, and I can tell you what it is, and I'll prove it for you real, real quick, okay? Um, so, um, um, So, so the so the statement is that uh, that uh, W uh, that you know the, the best W is uh, uh, sorry okay let's see I guess after it it's like it's a set okay so whatever so it's the set of X's such that the probability of uh, X given H naught over the probability of X given H1 is bigger than some threshold, and I'll put a subscript on it, alpha, because depending, so uh, so this is like a likelihood ratio, and if you want, so that, that function here, you know, something over here, H0 is really small and H1 is big, and over here, H0 is really big and H1 is really small, so it's some sort of, you know, whatever, it's some sort of function, right? And then I'm, uh, so, and then I'm putting some, some cutoff K alpha, right? So where it crosses the line here, that would correspond to where your threshold is, 
Okay, that, so that would define W. So I'm going to adjust the threshold so that I get the right alpha. Okay. So uh, so this is the this is where I should actually put K alpha because when it crosses this line into this function, that you know I'm drawing a contour and it says take everything up to this point, and you just adjust the you just adjust this uh, con you know this contour so that you get the right size. Is that clear enough? Okay. Is that does that work or not? Okay. And k alpha is some there's some description so, so, for calculating k yeah, alpha. Uh, this is p of x given h zero over p of x given h one. I just take the ratio of those two curves, and then some function is steeply falling. And then I'm going to say that the region w are all regions in x where this ratio, this function, is bigger than some you know some constant. Okay. So that tells me the form of what the, the, the regions of W should look like, and then I just find which one is the one that has the right size. So I just adjust the contour until I get to the thing there that, that you know, the, that probability is, is alpha. Um, so that's, this, that's the claim, and this is called the, the nyman pearson Luma. Okay. Um, I'm going to prove it to you, but I'll just mention that you know that, that thing that I had down here about the Bayesian bit. Uh, if you choose your risk as sort of one, uh, I mean your loss is one if you 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 know make a type one or type two error, you, like you you, you, know, you did the wrong thing, and zero if you do the right thing, uh, then uh, then you can go through the Bayesian procedure, and there's a specific prior which then results in the same region. So, uh, so it, it satisfies this thing that I was saying that you can think of it as a basic procedure. Okay, so I'm just going to draw it graphically though. So let's imagine that okay, here's the, the space of my data. Okay, so this is like my my x, you know, uh, x1, x2, and here's you know some funky region w. So if you want, you can ima imagine that like under your null, you get a you know you have some probability distribution here, right? Um, and under your alternate, you have some other probability distribution, okay? And uh, so that's a lot like what you do with like machine learning and neural nets and boosted decision trees and all these things. You have a bunch of samples under your two things and you're trying to like, you know, come up with some procedure to separate them or classify them. And so this is like a classification problem and what I'm telling you is the best possible classification is this. Okay, so uh, no, no boosted decision tree is going to do better than that because this is a theorem, okay? So, um, Okay, so let me prove it to you by considering some, so this W is that W, and I'm gonna just consider uh, some variation of this thing. Okay, so um, so I'll have uh, this part, and then I'll have this part. Okay, so what do I need? Um, this other variation also needs to satisfy, you know, it still needs the same sort of type one error thing. So, you know, it still needs the same size. So what I know is that the probability of this wedge, given H naught, has to equal the probability of the other wedge, given H naught. You know that when I change W, the stuff that I added and the stuff that I subtracted need to they need to be the same under the null. Okay, and then I also know that. Um, okay, so I can use that, and then I can say, what about under the the, the other. The other scenario: What is the probability of, of this wedge under the uh, under the alternate? Okay, so the probability of this wedge under the alternate. Um, what do I know about it? Well, I know that this stuff is outside of this contour, so I know that this ratio is less than k alpha, right? So then I just move. So I move h1 over there, and I move that. Uh, well, okay, then it's. You know, this is W, so if I'm out here, it's the other way around. So when I'm, let's see if I can uh, move around my head. Yeah, so this probability is bigger, right? So this is this is the equation for W inside. So outside, this sign switches. So I move it over there. So H1 is going to be bigger than this P of, you know, the wedge uh, under H0 over K alpha. And the same thing over here, you know, the P of the other wedge under H1 is going to be smaller than P of, you know, of the same whatever wedge under H0 over K alpha. Okay. The other wedge is in W. What's that? The other wedge is in W. already. 
Yeah, so this region is in is inside of W. Okay, so so, I, so nice. I know that all of these points side of, you know. Okay, so you did switch the greater than, okay, I got it. I hope not. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. It, this is in W, so when I move it over here, it's the less than sign is pointing to that. Right, so, so I wrote it on the opposite side. But okay, and since I know these things are the same, then what I know is that, uh, that so this probability is bigger than that probability. So what does that mean? That means that under the alternate, uh, um, uh, the uh, okay, you know that. Let's see. It's probably easier to think about the complement, but the the stuff that I took away had more probability under the alternate than the stuff that I added. So that, that variation has less power. Done. Okay, so um, uh, so that's like the, the proof of the nine Pearson lemma. And, uh, um, and so that's a pretty big, strong result. Okay. Now, if I get back into reality a little bit and I think about machine learning and stuff, which also does pretty well, the situation is that this works if I can really evaluate this function everywhere. Okay, that means I need some like program or closed form formula or something that allows me to calculate this ratio everywhere in the space of my data. And that's often not easy to do, especially when you have big, high dimensional, crazy data where you don't have like an analytic function for what like, I mean, this applies equally well for like faces of, you know, like facial detection or something. I want to like figure out two different types of people or something, right? So, um, but what is my probability on this? You know, I don't know what that thing is. So if you don't have it, uh, then, you, then you can think of machine learning as essentially trying to learn this thing. Um, so, uh, but if you do have it, then this is the best way to go. Okay, so, um, <clears throat> all right, now, okay, so, the, so then what's the, so yeah, so then the thing that I wanted to say is that already you see that, uh, that so what is the quantity that's so good? It's a likelihood ratio, okay? So that's why likelihood ratios are like important and used all the time, okay, because of this thing. Now, this is great, you know, fantastic, but, uh, but it's also, th this result is for what are called simple hypotheses. So I have a, a null and an alternate, and they're completely fixed. There's no, like, wiggly parameters or anything like that. I know exactly what I'm looking for, and I know exactly what my alternate hypotheses are. Then it's a, then it's a solved problem. If I go to the situation where my alternate hypothesis, you know, I sort of, I know what it looks like, but there's some, you know, there's like some detector calibration or something that I don't know about that makes this distribution move around a little bit, or I'm thinking my alternate is like, you know, my null is no Higgs, my alternate is Higgs, but I don't know the mass of the Higgs, so now I have a, a composite hypothesis, an alternate hypothesis. Uh, there is no such theorem. Okay, there is, you can show that there is no best test for all of the alternates, okay, uh, if you're in a, if you have a, a situation like that. So. Uh, those things are what are formally called uniformly most powerful tests, and you can prove that they don't exist in general. So, um, so that's so as great as this is, it also just tells you it's not going to help you. Uh, so if I talk about a situation like this, these are like it's a parameter space; it's not just two points, right? So, uh, so there's no, there is not going to be a theorem like that in general. Okay. All right. So, uh, fine. So I'm done with uh, with hypothesis tests. Um, there's not a Huge amount of time, so let me say. Uh, so let me move to. So wait, how do we find k? To find w, don't we? <clears throat> you adjust k until you satisfy, you know, that the the probability of x given h naught bigger than k alpha is is uh, whatever one minus alpha. You just adjust the you just adjust this threshold until you hit one minus alpha. Yeah. the alpha. Yeah, so that's what I was trying to draw here. Like k is I don't know what it is, so mm -hmm. as I move k around it turns into defining what W is, and I just scan the contour until I find the thing. So, okay. um, and the, you can do it like with Lagrange multiplier or something if you want. All right, so, okay, now let, um, um, so let's say something, about, about this one now. So the, um, so the, 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 the confidence interval <coughs> thing uh, you can think of uh, as, uh, so you can think of a confidence interval as what's called a, well, I'm not going to do that yet. Let's just ask the question, I, I told you what this property I wanted, or this, this notion of uh, coverage. 
which depends on whatever the true parameter points are, um, is equal to the, the probability that your interval uh, uh, covers um, uh, uh, theta. Okay. So, or the, you know, the theta is inside of the interval that you get. Okay. Um, so it's the probability of this thing. But the idea is that, uh, uh, that when I say probability, I mean that you know you. You imagine getting new data all the time, and each time you get a new interval, and you ask how often does it cover the true point. Okay, so that's what I want, and I want, so this is this quantity called uh, coverage, and for a 95, you know, when you say it's a 95% interval, what you mean is that it, it has this property, the coverage is 95%, but you want, um, you want, you know, the, the, you know, like the coverage um, of theta, equal say you know, 90 uh, 95 percent but for all things okay and so the question is how can you how can you do that how can I come up with some procedure that will do it okay um, so so instead of trying let me ask a, a different question let's say that you come with a procedure how would I check okay you give me a procedure and I want to check this this property right uh, so it could be a Bayesian procedure you can use a Bayesian procedure for drawing these intervals, great. And I can ask, what is the coverage of your Bayesian procedure, right? And maybe you don't care about coverage, but I can still ask about it, right? So, um, um, okay, so the, uh, uh, so how would I do it? I would pick some point, some true value. I would generate a bunch, I would generate some data. I would apply the procedure to get an interval. I'd do that over and over again, and I would just check to see how often it covered, right? And then I would get a number, okay? So you can use that same idea to actually uh, figure out how uh, how you're going to make this thing work, uh, and so this is called so this thing is called whatever the Nyman construction. Okay. okay. So the idea is that so I'll draw a picture here. I guess I'll draw in 3D sort of. Um, so let's say that this is my x, okay, and these are and this is my like theta direction. For every value of theta, okay, so here's a, here's some value of theta, you know, theta one. Okay. Um, now, and then I'm going to draw up uh, p of x given theta. Okay. So I have some some probability function, right? And for a different value of theta, you know, theta two, I have some I have some other you know probability density function. Okay. Now. If for every value of theta I just define some region from say here to here, and I call, you know, so this is sort of like my my W, and I'll just give it an index, you know, theta theta one, and over here I have some other region, W theta two. Um, I could, uh, and I do that now. Imagine I do that for all the different values of theta, and I'm going to get some thing that kind of connects it all. Okay, so I'm just. You see kind of what I'm doing? So as I scan theta, I just come up with some procedure that's going to define an acceptance region, whatever, like in, um, uh, in X. Okay. Well, if I do that, what properties will this thing have? Okay. So what I'll do is I'll say, now that I get some particular value of my data, X naught, um, sorry, that's a bad choice of X naught, let me put it here, uh, X naught, um, so I need to kind of draw from uh, Okay, um, all these values, of, uh, the, the, the data that I have is in the acceptance region for all the, you know, some, some set of values of the, of the okay. So this will be, so I will say that my, the way that I draw my interval will be, uh, you know, this will be the, the, I'll say that they're just like lower and high, okay. So my confidence interval will be theta low to theta high. So this is like a 1D example. So here's a procedure that I did for this particular data set. I got a confidence interval. I said this region of theta is compatible with the data. Um, so, so the question is, will this work? Will this do what I want it to do? So if I get new data, I just imagine every time I get new data, I'll get a new interval. Okay. But the, so then now I pick some point and imagine it's the true point. So let's say theta two is the true point. Well, you know, by construction. 95% of the time, the data is going to fall in here, in the, between you know, in this region, right? By construction, so so these lines will go through 
and this value of theta will be the inter in the interval 95% of the time. So you just like, you just said, what do I want? And I just kind of back, you know, I just reverse engineer the procedure that will do what I want. Okay, so this is a, a procedure that by construction will give me confidence intervals that cover. So, so that picture is maybe a little complicated, so let me just draw the same picture, but not in, in So here's x, and here's theta, and, and uh, so this is this thing right here. So, um, so what I know is for each value of theta, this probability between here and here for an x is, say, 95%, and that's true for all of them. Okay. Um, so these are also and then, so, I, so in this yeah. case, what you're doing is you're taking the probability of, of the data given the uh, whatever your theory is here, your theta. Yeah. So. Um, and and you're taking from 2.5 percentile to 97.5 percentile. Yeah. So I, at this point, I, it will be true for any choice of this w. Like I can start from zero and get to 95 percent. Could you start from zero and get to one percent? That's dumb. Well, I would do well that would be a one percent. You know, I would have a okay type one error of 99 percent. So could you just eliminate the center? I mean, I'm trying to figure out what my options are in terms of building this. This w. w. This w. Can I come right back to that? Yeah. So I just want to make sure that it's clear that if I this thing right here, this whole thing is called the confidence belt. I get a particular value of x you know, for my data. So I'm going to draw it like that again. And then where the, the values of theta that intersect this belt are going to be my confidence interval for this data. <coughs> and this procedure of making confidence intervals will cover by construction. Okay. Because it's the, you're doing the same thing you would do to check if it worked. So, um, but now what is that zero in this case? It, it, it's like for a particular data a set. Particular data set. Yeah. For a different data set, I'll get a different value of x zero. You know, so this will be you know for a different data set, and and now my confidence interval will be you know, from here to there. So it will be different for. Uh, so when I get different data, my intervals move around, but they, but whatever the true value is, it will produce data inside the band 95 percent of the time. So it will always be in the interval. Okay. Um, so it's kind of a funny logical statement that you just need to do for yourself, but it, it works. So, um, okay, now the thing that, so that's great, but the, what's com left completely ambiguous at this stage is your choice of W, okay? Um, so all, at this point, this like all I've done is kind of enforced, this coverage is like, that's why I said it's like, like this notion of type one error, okay? Because that's the thing that you're controlling. So my choices of W have to satisfy this constraint that it's 95%, you know, the, uh, so, so that's why, so coverage you should think of as the analog of type one error. That's the thing that, you know, my, 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 dis, my threshold for discovery is five sigma, my, my interval is supposed to be 95%, that's the thing I was pre-specified. Now the question is, what choice of W is a good choice of W? And so well, now you need to tell me what you mean by good. And as in the case of Nyman Pearson, the thing that I want to do somehow is maximize my power against the alternatives, right? So what I want to think of is for any value that's true, all the other values are the alternative, and what choice of W is going to kind of uh, be good, okay? So for instance, you know, I could just like randomly choose, you know, regions of X that give me 95% and my confidence interval will be like random blobs or something. And, uh, you know, it will work, it will cover, but it's not uh, useful in any way, right? It has no power in any nice way. So, um, and then what you, so then the, I guess the idea that then the, the kind of logical extension of this Nyman Pearson is that the way that you choose this W is again, it's, uh, it's L of X given uh, theta uh, over L of X given something else. Okay, so I, I'll fill that in a second. So my, my W of theta, you want to be equal to this, you know, the whatever the set of x is such that this thing is bigger than again k alpha. But so now before we had a specific alternate, okay? So theta here is my null. Like I'm assuming that's true, that's the thing that's generating my data. And uh, I'm going to adjust this thing so that I get 95% coverage. And now my question is, what should I put here to have the best power? And so a good choice um, is to put uh, the theta hat of x, which means uh, I'm going to find the best value of this parameter given the data, 
and I'm going to put that, that's going to be the specific alternate that I test against. And so that, what, what that ends up doing is that, you know, here's this x in my plot, right? Um, that, that x is the best, your, your best idea of what the parameter is. So when, when you're at thetas that are close to that point, this likelihood ratio is going to be close to 1. And, uh, and so they, all of those points will be there. As you start getting uh, farther away, this likelihood ratio will start to get small, and then you won't, then you won't sit in there anymore, and you will reject those points. Okay, so, um, so there is this kind of extension of the idea of this Nyman Pearson, which is a, a typical way of drawing contours. And this turns out to be exactly what you do, right, when you plot contours. <clears throat> um, so I'll end with this, and then that hopefully it'll be kind of a nice, it will go back to where we started with Mike, is what does this thing look like, right? This is contours of a likelihood ratio. So if I do the one-dimensional version of it, um, here's, sorry, I shouldn't have been I'm just, <laughs> sorry. Here's, here's theta. Now I'm writing minus, you know, log of the, uh, likelihood of theta, okay? Um, so the minimum of this thing is theta hat, right, given the data. That's the best estimate. And so I'm going to start here, and I'm going to go up some amount, okay? So this, this is now the log version, but it's related to k alpha, so whatever this is like, you know, this minus log k alpha the way that I wrote it. Um, and I'm going to say, um, did I get my signs backwards? Um, yeah, no, okay. Uh, um, it does look kind of backwards, doesn't it? Um, oh yeah, no, this because there's the minus. Okay, sorry. Yeah, when I do minus, they, you know, all the points where this thing is bigger than something is less than on this plot. Okay, sorry. Um, so, um, so this is this is going to be my region. You know, this is going to be my confidence intervals between here and here. So, the typical thing that you do, where you just plot the likelihood, you know, likelihood. And you go up some amount from the, the minimum, is is and you, and you just draw a line at some point, is the typical likelihood ratio thing, and it kind of in some sense follows from this Nyman Pearson type of logic. Okay, um, and then uh, um, and so then the the if I can just say the last thing is that um, so hopefully this won't get too confusing. So let me just. Uh, um, because this, this will be important in the most time. So, is this, so let's just pick one of these lines, right? So this is for a particular value of theta. Um, here's my x, right? So my x in general is some like high dimensional stuff, right? And I don't know how to draw this thing. It's really like a big blob in high dimensions. But what I've done is I've mapped this high dimensional space of the data onto a one number, right? And then I'm just asking how, you know, what this likelihood ratio is. So if I think about this one number, and I think of it as minus, okay, now I'll put in a 2, whatever, minus 2 log of the likelihood at theta over uh, the likelihood at uh, theta best, okay? Um, it can't be smaller than 0, so here's 0. And I imagine repeating this over and over again, so I'm going to get data, and I'm going to calculate this quantity, okay? So, I'm, so I pick a particular value of theta. This is where I'm going to be, so that's this value of theta. That's the top. But when I get different data, the curve is moving around, right? So theta best is moving around, and the height of this thing, that's what I'm plotting, is changing. So I do it over and over again, I get a distribution, and that's the thing that we were talking about before. That's the thing that has like a chi-square-like distribution. So the distribution of this thing right here, let me call it just Q of theta for kicks, of Q of theta, when theta is actually true, uh, uh, is equal to a chi-square distribution that depends on where the dimensionality is. So you know, so once you know that distribution, you can go out some distance and you know, and you can make this thing be alpha. Okay, so you know how far out you have to go, and that is just turning this plot sideways and saying, this is this, this log of the alpha. So it tells you how far out you have to go to get your 95%. And so. To get your original theta hat, you have chosen it up. Um, but that matter because you yeah, but theta hat is this like estimate of the you best, chose right? Yeah. K yeah. alpha. You've chosen the threshold. 
Yeah, yeah. Theta hat is, I, I get a, a likelihood curve. Theta hat is just the minimum of the likelihood curve. So once I get some data, I can draw this thing, right? The theta hat is minus the likelihood Yeah, minus log yeah. likelihood. Yeah, sorry. Uh, so that's the likelihood. Yeah, maximum likelihood. Um, okay, so the, so the, the last, so um, this thing, this statement, this was true, this was this sort of, quote, asymptotic statement. Okay, so what you can think of, so let me just try to end with this, is that um, the typical thing that people do, uh, where they, you know, you just do some, you just go up some, you know, some amount from the minimum, you can think of as, uh, as the Simon Pearson type of thinking that comes from the Simon construction of drawing confidence intervals and all that stuff, and it rests on the fact that you know that the distribution of this quantity looks like a chi square, so you know how far out to go to get 95%. Um, if you are not an asymptotic limit, then this thing doesn't look like this. It might, you know, it might look, you know, whatever. I don't know some other thing, and you might need to go, you know, a different distance to get 95%. Okay, so. Um, and and uh, and so that and, and particle physics language is called the Feldman Cousins procedure. Okay, but you can think of it as just a way of calibrating your test. You're just making sure that it's actually 95 percent. And you know, because the typical thing of going a certain amount maybe will give you 93 percent or something, and that's not acceptable. So, um, and then the, the the other thing that I want to say is that this, when you actually generate this distribution. You're somehow really thinking about generating a bunch of data, and so you're thinking uh, you have these you know these probabilities of the data being being bigger than this threshold or something, and it's a very frequentist notion, okay? Um, but if I think that this asymptotic situation is right, then I just always have the same cutoff, and really I just have the likelihood function, and I just chop it at some point. So um, so if you just buy it, if you just always use that procedure, it might not have exactly the right coverage properties, but it has a lot of the nice features that Bayesian analysis has, which is that you are, uh, you only, you base all your inference off of the likelihood curve, okay, for the data that you have. So the, the, the frequentest way you think about all the data that you didn't get, okay, you know, you have to, everything's based on like data you might not have gotten. Okay, so like, what's the chance that the data that I didn't get was more extreme than the data that I got? It's a strange way to like make inference, right? If you just say like, I got some data, here's my likelihood curve, then you base something called the likelihood principle, and all your inference should be based off of that, then you can do it, and this procedure will give you approximate coverage. Okay, so that's a, whatever. Okay, so that's a lot of random stuff. So, um, so I'll stop. That's that's the idea. So, yeah. yeah, a lot of random stuff. But it is kind of funny that we look at these things all the time, right? But like the story about where they come from is definitely uh, a bit involved, right? So, um, okay. Thank you. For the physical reasons, uh, how many people uh, think that they will come back or continue in the series so that we know how big of a space? to think about it. Okay.